Hello, I'm Mentorism, and we're back in World War K2. Now, we're back at Juna, after several of our Kerbals have had to crash land on the planet to avoid the Mechjeb forces in orbit, and are awaiting rescue. Uh, I believe we have a grand total of six Kerbals on the ground, in two groups, about 20 kilometers apart. But, uh, there is unfortunately a bigger problem than the Mechjeb forces keeping them here. As you can see, the crashed fighter from the last episode has been scattered over a wide area. However, we forgot one thing. Unfortunately, the fighter was pretty high-tech and was being fueled off of a large amount of antimatter. That antimatter tank was not emptied. It is currently on the planet's surface with enough antimatter to cause a several gigaton explosion and it is slowly discharging its power cell when that happens the magnetic confinement will fail, and the antimatter will do bad things. So we need to make some a way of getting the antimatter off the planet and quickly. We have a time limit on this mission. Now, I know what you're saying. We could just take the Kerbals off the planet. However, Mechja forces are basically patrolling and blockading the planet. Any vessel coming out of a gravity well is inherently slower and it's following a very predictable flight path and it's a really easy shot. Taking our Kerbals off the planet will basically be suicidal. However, if we can try and get the antimatter off the planet, we can... well, it doesn't matter if the antimatter gets shot down when it's exited the atmosphere. Now, what we're going to do for this is we're going to basically use Kerbal Attachment System, which I've installed just for this episode, because there's no other really other way of moving parts. So, we're going to be using the Kerbal Attachment System. Um, we're going to take a little buggy down. We're going to get to the two Kerbals who ejected from the fighter. They are going to then ride the buggy over to the antimatter containment units, plug the antimatter containment units onto the buggy, then the buggy's going to fly off into the space and um, hopefully the antimatter containment will fail when it's, you know, out of the atmosphere. So what we're doing here is we're putting a few rockets on the front of the buggy so that when we need to point the buggy to space we can use the normal rockets to just lift the nose and then the thermal rocket at the back to just give us a lot of thrust. The thermal rocket is pretty efficient, it's not amazing, there are better things, there are like plasma thrusters, but it gives us a whole lot of thrust and we can run it directly off the reactor. Bearing in mind if anyone wants to actually make uh, the thermal rocket um, in Interstellar from home, you need to have the thermal rocket connected directly to the reactor because it doesn't work off electricity, it works off the thermal heat of the reactor. And of course, the antimatter reactor is like the hottest reactor of all of them. Um, now, to get this up there, we will use a small warp drive, we'll have a few uh, SRBs, and then we'll just put a load of uh, liquid fuel below it. Checking the Delta V, I think we need more liquid fuel, so let's put more liquid fuel down there. We're just going to try and tweak the SRBs to be a slow enough burn that, uh, you know, they'll actually have the right thrust to weight ratio and won't just waste all of their energy early on in the burn. So about 1.24 is reasonable. I'd like it probably a bit higher, but it's fine. I could always tweak it a bit higher if I wanted. And let's put our parachutes on. Now I don't know how good the parachutes are going to be. Juno's atmosphere is of course incredibly thin and we can't fit an amazing amount of parachutes on. We've got two command chairs there for the Kerbals to go in. And we've got curl attachment systems at the side with pluggy things. And if the pluggy bits fail, we can always try and use the uh, magnetic clamps. And let's put some heat radiators on. Now, we're only going to be firing up the thermal uh, engine just to do a bit of entry into the atmosphere if we run out of liquid fuel. And then to get off the atmosphere. So there won't be that much being used from it. So there shouldn't be that much heat build up. Um, other than that, let's just put some struts on. I think we're almost ready to go. I'm just going to, oh, of course, clamp it. Now, antimatter as a weapon and all this, it's, well, in real life, Really, really kind of crap because you'd need to collect that much antimatter, and that's really difficult. And if you can collect that much antimatter, you've obviously got a way of creating enough energy. However, if you had that much antimatter in the space, and then you let it go, bad things would happen. Uh, let's be completely honest. What happens with antimatter and matter is basically when antimatter and antimatter meet, they're basically the opposites of each other, and they just uh, cancel each other out. But they don't cancel each other out entirely. They both contain and are made of matter or energy. One is the opposite of the other one, but they're both still something. And that means that, of course, E equals MC squared, you can't get rid of energy, it's conserved. The matter and the antimatter will 
basically annihilate to make energy, and that energy will fly off. That energy being in the form of gamma rays and, I think, neutrinos. Um, and that sudden burst of gamma rays will cause a lot of excitation in nearby atoms. And basically it will cause heat, probably a pressure wave. Maybe even an EMP, thinking about it, because it would excite the electrons out of their shells by uh, gamma absorption. So, thinking about it, you might even get an EMP from it. And it's probably not a good thing. Now, of course, if it isn't in an atmosphere, when the atom at a stops being contained, whatever it's touching or is around it, like, say, the containment unit, will get annihilated. That's the actual term, by the way. Antimatter and matter meeting and cancel each other out. That's called annihilation. Uh, them annihilating the containment unit wouldn't be so much of an issue. It's when you get that shock wave and the heat propagated through an atmosphere that you have a problem. So if we can get the antimatter to orbit, it'll annihilate the craft, which is why it's a fully automated craft once we get the Kerbals off the buggy. And then any remains will sort of fly out. If any antimatter is remaining, it'll hit the top of Juno's atmosphere and you'll probably get a little interesting light show. Right, so I'm going to skip ahead and I'm going to warp to Juno because warping is annoying. Right, so we're around Juno. It's a very wonky orbit. It's a little bit inclined, but uh, if we use the last bit of fuel we've got remaining, we should be able to bring our orbit down on top of the Kerbals. Now, we're aiming for the two that uh, came down with the fighter because they're also closest to the remains of the fighter. I believe they're about a kilometre and a half away. Uh, oops. How much have we got left? Uh, and we're out. Right, we're going to have to start using the thermal rocket. And a little bit gently. Because the buggy isn't perfectly aligned in terms of its centre of mass. Um, if I go full throttle it might be uh, a little bit... Things might go weird. So let's bring her down. Now normally we tend to avoid unmanned craft because uh, Mech Jeb of course being an AI could quite easily hack them. AI... it... it it lives on a computer, it breathes on a computer, you'd think an AI would maybe be better at hacking than humans. So we're trying to avoid using uh, automated craft as much as possible. However, in this circumstance, the craft will be going to orbit. We don't want to have to send a Kerbal up, because that would be unfortunate. Now we're back to real-time speed. We were going at four times before, because it's a bit slow. And we're going to try and land this. Now, the parachutes don't seem to be slowing this down enough. This craft will be a little bit delicate. It's fairly long. And it looks like we're probably hitting the ground at about 60 meters a second if we let it do its thing. So we're going to try and bring it down gently on the thermal rocket. We are 700 meters away from the Kerbals, which is unfortunate. But we can just drive back over to them. It will take a little while, however. We have to be very careful with this craft. It is very long and doesn't have much ground clearance. And it gently does it. Gently does it. Now, the amount of antimatter contained in uh, those containers... We're probably looking at several gigatons worth of explosion if, of course, it's using the normal units of KSP, which I believe is kilograms. Um, yeah, we're looking at a several gigaton explosion. I'm not exactly sure. Um, no one's really looked at the propagation of an explosion from an antimatter containment failure. Oh, um, oh. Oh, oh, we've popped the front tires, so we, we're not going to be able to travel anywhere we're like this. Um... Yeah, no, it's going to take way too long, and time is of the essence. So I believe let's get one of the curbs to come over and rebuild the tires for us. Now, of course, uh, both the Elysian and the uh, Sticks are working together to defeat Nat Jeb. Along with the Nat, we haven't seen any uh, Nat Kerbals yet, or was there one in the other group of four? I can't remember. However, our friendly Sticks Kerbal is going to do the mission. They basically they played rock, paper, scissors, and drew straws or something. And uh, it's decided that the Sticks Kerbal will do his best. Now, walking will take a while, so we're going to just use a lot of uh, monopropellant. You can use monopropellant on Duna. It doesn't get you very high. Gravity does fight it pretty well. You may be getting possibly 5% for us to weight above one, but uh, it is just enough for us to be able to take over, uh, overtake, fly over that ridge and get down to the antimatter rescue craft. But going back to the previous topic of the size of an explosion from an antimatter containment failure, no one's really looked into it properly that I can find. I've looked a lot on the internet for this kind of thing, and it's estimated by a couple of people in some forums and so on I've been looking at that maybe sort of several, many, many tons worth of uh, 
antimatter would possibly see a, a very large gigaton explosion because, of course, you are basically converting it to pure energy. Uh, when you're looking at, say, a fusion reaction, you're still looking at high single digits, maybe, if you're lucky. Um, but you're not looking at pure energy release, which is pretty damn crazy. Uh, you think about the power of, say, a hydrogen bomb, then imagine the fact that this antimatter can canister contains probably more actual fissile material in terms of if you said antimatter was a fissile material. Uh, come on, get boarding. Come on, come on. There we go. Uh, fissile material than a hydrogen bomb would, and also then consider it's a lot more efficient. So it's possibly not a good idea to have these containment failures happen on Juna for a start. It would definitely wreck the planet. Um, we're looking at some serious damage to the planet and probably ejecting a fair amount of its atmosphere to space. But we're also looking at definitely these six kerbals getting absolutely smushed, which probably wouldn't be very good. On the plus side, it might damage the mech ship ships in orbit, but that would only be because of uh, debris being ejected from the planet. They wouldn't actually uh, be directly affected by the blast, of course, because they're outside the atmosphere itself. Um, right. It looks like we're not getting a lot of speed up. I don't want to go any faster than maybe 5 meters per second if I can help it. So we're going to skip ahead to here and pick up our other Kerbal. And, oh, that that was unfriendly. That was unfair. Maybe there's still a little bit of animosity going on between the Styx and the Elysian uh, Kerbals because of, you know, the previous whole war thing. I know it was kind of a setup by the Nat, uh, but maybe, maybe they still have got an issue with each other. Maybe they just don't play that nicely. They, they agree, maybe, that, uh, you know, it's the best they have to team up, they have to beat Mech Jab, they were set up beforehand. But there's still maybe a bit of bad blood. So let's go to target and speed control 5. We're using the Mech Jab or Rover Autopilot just so that it's uh, a little bit simpler of holding the heading and not having to keep continually braking. Also, it stops having to be in docking mode. All right, this, uh, this might take a little while. So we're going to skip ahead and... Uh, Hopefully we won't have lost too much of our percentage of uh, battery in the antimatter containment units. We're now down to 40% containment. Which is not particularly great considering we still need to attach them and launch them. Hmm. Alright, we're coming up on our first one now. And yeah, we're on about 28% containment, which uh, is pushing it. Alright, um, as you can see, by the way, when both Kerbals are in the chairs, they revert back to their original textures. I don't know if that's a problem with Texture Replacer, or if it's just a way that the game is coded that is bizarre and the Texture Replacer mod is going to have to try and overcome. Uh, but instantly, uh, by, the, by, the, by the way, everyone keeps asking about how I do the textures. It's the Texture Replacer mod. Um, of course, the links to my textures are on the Reddit page that I set up. He's very happy. Um, all right, let's grab that. Oh, and if you're using the latest version of the Texture Replacer mod, uh, someone very kindly uh, updated the Texture Replacer file that I put on. Actually, let's grab the winch butt while I'm here and made it applicable for the new version because in the new version of the Texture Replacer mod, they changed the file system. Uh, I'm using the old one, but they updated it and changed the mod around so that uh, it actually works differently. And someone very kindly rearranged the uh, the texture files so that they actually work with the new version which is very kind of them you'll find that in the comments below right let's plug that in and right back to the uh the rover we might just pull this off we do have 24 percent left on our can we get in the yep yeah, there we go 24 percent left on our power let's winch this uh, puppy in now let's just turn slightly so that we're not maybe clipping the wheel and uh, retract. Yeah. Okay, we're reeling in our first antimatter unit. The second one is only about 200 meters distance, so it's not too bad. However, the issue will be trying to get this above atmosphere before the containment fails. Uh, okay. Um, that's interesting. It appears to have gone into no clip mode when it's been dragged. Um, can we get it to pop out? Uh, hmm. Okay, um, I guess maybe if we just release the winch and let it flow, 
like behind us, we could always just pull it back in again. So let's uh, extend. And retract. Okay, let's stop retracting. Let's just extend it a bit more. And uh, let it get a little bit behind us. And then we'll just go over and get the the, yeah, the next containment unit. Alright, so let's head over to this one. It is uh, just under 200 meters away. We are now down to 20% containment. It's going to be close, put it that way. Alright, so speed 5. I don't want to push it any further because, of course, if we push it further and the rover breaks up, then we're not getting either of them off the planet. Of course, it's just as bad if one goes off as the second one goes off. It doesn't really make a difference to us. There would be a very large hole. It's just a slightly bigger hole in the other case. Right. Down at 19%. Ooh. Pushing the limits. However, we are now up to the second one 50 meters away. Now, of course, currently when we're actually getting antimatter, scientists are creating antimatter by whacking elements into each other, well, not elements, uh, literally subatomic particles into each other um, at very high speeds. And that basically gets them to emit lots of different things because you're smashing them and then they're... Basically, it's a Feynman diagram. If you smash a couple of things into each other, you'll get a load of stuff given off. And of course, that stuff given off has to be balanced. It has to be equal in a lot of different ways to the stuff that initially goes into it. These are called quantum numbers, and you get quantum numbers such as uh, charge and some other weird things like, say, charm. And these all have to add up. So if you, say, smash some neutrons into each other, if you, say, got an electron out, which would be a positive charge, you'd have to somehow balance that with a negative charge. So an anti-electron might, or something similar. Um, so basically, you're wanting to balance all these different things. Which means that if you're getting something out that's got a mass and you didn't put enough mass in in the first place, or if you put mass in, basically you can get antimatter out from crashing different things together. And that's how we're currently creating antimatter. Uh, of course, if you're creating antimatter that's got a charge, say positrons, which are anti-electrons, uh, which have a charge, you could then, in theory, uh, contain them using a magnetic field. Because, of course, they'd be repelled by... Uh, similarly charged magnetic field. Which is basically the idea behind these containment units. And the containment units in Instellar do require power. If they run out of power, then, yeah, they explode and destroy anything nearby. Whoa, that's quite the somersault. Sherry Kerman, I think you're showing off a little bit. Now, let's just get out of here because we're about to launch this into orbit. We are down to less than 13% charge. Might be enough if this goes okay. Um, we actually haven't tested this. We didn't have time to test it. In my defense, we, we we don't normally test most of our stuff, but in this case, we really didn't have time to test this. Um, just winch that in. Now, I'm hoping that when we launch it, these don't flop around and cause us to have problems. Uh, they are, of course, not properly locked, so they might cause center of mass issues. I don't know exactly what the tolerances are on these, so let's pull the nose up a little bit more. Uh, a little bit more. Oh, 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 too much, too much. No, don't get damaged. Don't get damaged. Oh, okay, that's close. Can we turn it over? Yes, okay, I put enough SAS on that we can turn it over. Whew. Right, okay, now, that that would have been really bad if we hadn't. Also, it would been really bad if it had broken up. Okay, let's gently do it. We've got 10% charge. We can do it. Right, gently up. And thermal rocket. Oh, ooh, that's holding beautifully. That is holding a nice heading. Right, let's point her a little bit more directly up, I think. You can see our brave Kerbals disappearing into the background. We are at 9% charge and going directly up. Alright, hopefully we can get this so that it'll be outside the atmosphere by a decent margin when it uh, fails containment. Oh, oh, what's happened to the rocket? Why is the rocket not working? Why is the rocket not working? We're not going up very fast. We've still got liquid fuel, so we've got plenty of fuel. Actually, way more fuel than we'd need. Um, why? What's the issue? Um, that's fine, that's fine. The reactor's still working. Yep. Uh, oh, wait, you're in liquid fuel and oxidizer mode. No, just go to liquid fuel. Liquid fuel is the most efficient. It's uh, got the high specific impulse. All right, we are 
exiting the atmosphere quite nicely now. Our speed is going up quite rapidly. Let's have a look. Surface speed, yep, that's over a kilometer per second now. I think we've done it. We are we are now out of the atmosphere. Oh, we're going to be going past the Mechjeb uh, patrol fleet. Well, now isn't that interesting? I wonder if I wonder if the containment failure will damage any of the nearby Mechjeb ships. It's unlikely. Uh, all the antimatter that's in the containment will probably annihilate against the side of the container. I don't think much antimatter will be left to actually fly up in space and do a lot of damage. Because, of course, as the antimatter gets further away from the point of explosion, it's going to be a less concentrated dose, and what it'll do is it'll probably just impact very lightly on the edge of something and maybe damage it ever so slightly at a very atomic level. Um, the problem, of course, being in atmospheres, you get pressure waves, you get heat waves, you get all of this nasty stuff which you do not get in space. It's why nuclear weapons aren't particularly amazing in space. They can cause maybe a minor EMP, but nowhere near what they can do in the atmosphere. They, of course, do not have pressure or heat going for them. Nuclear weapons in space, if you're actually going to damage something in space with a nuclear weapon, you can need to land the nuke on the thing. Probably inside it. Oh, beautiful. Right, we're made in space. We've got 3% charge on the containment unit. Oh, and it's gone. Oh. Obviously, we misestimated the charge slightly, but that's a successful mission! We've saved our Kerbals, and now they're just kind of still stuck on Juna. Hmm. That's going to be interesting. I've been Enter Elysium. Um, if you've enjoyed the episode, please like, and if you're not subscribed and you want to subscribe, please subscribe. Uh, I'm sorry this is slightly late. Last, ep uh, last week, kind of a lot of stuff was up in the air, and uh, I'm just adding in an addendum. YouTube's not great with processing videos, but that, you kind of already knew that. Anyway, I really really hope you enjoyed the episode, and next time, well, I guess we're going to have to see if we can get our Kerbals off the planet, or, you know, defend them, if Mechjeb comes to them. At least this crisis has been averted. Next time, I'll definitely have to vent the antimatter before we crash land. Stay shiny. <laughs>